City Council regular meeting, Tuesday, February 17, 2015, 6.30 p.m. Civic Center, 115 South 4th Street, now in session. Please rise for invocation and pledge allegiance. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we ask that you give us the guidance and wisdom so that we may make the proper decisions concerning the issues facing our town and its citizens. We further ask that you watch over all public safety personnel, members of the armed forces, wherever they may be. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. Kirk, please call the roll. Clayton. Here. Call. Here. Kelser. Here. Call. Here. Here. Item one, discuss act on approval of the consent agenda. A, the financial reports for January 2015. B, the minutes of the meetings held in January 2015. C, claims for the month of January 2015. Motion to approve. So moved. Second. Second. Call, please. Clay sent. Yes. Call. Yes. Kelzer. Yes. Call. Yes. Gunner. Yes. <laughs> Item two, public comment. No one signed up. Item three, discuss act on reappointment of Robert Barnett, Aaron Grafman, and Amber Baldwin to the Henry and Housing Authority. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? Oh. Pardon? No, but we know all of them. The poll of council, please. Lyson. Yes. Hall. Yes. Kelzer. Yes. Hall. Yes. yes. Goodner. Yes. Item four, discuss act on head of funding for the Henry Tennis Association for lighting, bathrooms, stands, or continued phases of improvements for the Main Street Tennis Courts. Is there a motion to approve? I make a motion to approve that. Second. Second. Discussion? Uh, Mr. Here. Kennedy, did you have some comments on the, the uh, tennis court? Uh, Mark Johnson is going to speak for us. Okay. Mr. Johnson? I think you have to turn it on. There's a little button right there on the front, on the very top. Thank you so much for meeting with us today. My name is Mark Johnson, and I'm here representing the Henrietta Tennis Courts Project Group. Uh, on March 18th, 2014, we came to the City Council you gave us written permission to pursue our project to rebuild the Main Street Courts. We're here tonight to give you an update on our project and ask you to approve our plan to build a new facility at 12th and Main. I'll give you some basic information and you're going to find more detailed information in the binders that James just gave you. We'll also show you a video rendering and then we'll be very happy to answer any questions when we're done. The Main Street Tennis Courts have unrepairable foundation problems and the courts will soon become unsafe for play. The surface is coming up in chunks. Stop by and here's what we've got right now. They're just, there's not much there. Where the cracking is occurring, they're, they're, they're just starting to come up in chunks. The fencing is poor, the backboard sticks out too far onto the playing surface and the courts do not have lights. The Main Street Courts, they need some help. They need some help. After consulting with many experts and contractors, we've developed a plan to rebuild the facility. Our plan calls for the construction of four new post-tension concrete courts on top of the existing courts. Post-tension concrete is the preferred method for new court construction. 
and the four inch concrete overlay will provide a solid foundation that will last for decades. The new courts will be state of the art and we will have them built by tennis court professionals. The next part of the plan will be to add new black vinyl fencing. All the old fencing will be removed with the exception of the vertical poles on the north and the west sides. These poles have been set inside the rock wall and we do not want to risk damage to the wall by removing them. We will have these poles capped to match the rest of the fencing. The new black vinyl fencing will frame the facility and will greatly enhance the view from Main Street. A new block backboard will be built on the south side of court number four. This will be an outstanding training tool for Henrietta's kids. I know I spent hundreds of hours hitting on the backboard of court four when I was a kid. The new backboard will become a part of the south fence and will be safely off the playing surface. A backboard on court number four is a Henrietta tradition. The final part of this initial project will be the addition of a new six pole light system. Three poles will be placed just outside the east wall and three poles will be placed just outside the west wall. All the poles will be off the playing surface. Adding lights to this facility is extremely important. The new lights will provide a safe, accessible location for Henrietta's kids to exercise, play tennis, and meet their friends at night. We want to build four new courts, new fencing, new backboard, and new lights. That's the project we're presenting tonight. Now how do we do it? During the past 11 months, our tennis group has raised $161,470. This money was raised specifically for the construction of a new tennis facility at 12th and Main. We spent $2,800 on the lot behind the backboard, and we currently have a cash balance of $158,670. Have another thousand to add to that on Monday. It's on the way. Last Monday, we had a very meaningful, productive meeting with the Henrietta Economic Development Authority. We sincerely appreciate their positive comments and the time they took to discuss our project. The head of board directed us to the city council tonight, and we believe they will partner with us to build this facility if we get your approval tonight to move forward. In a brief summary, we're estimating the new construction for this project to cost approximately $215,252. The Henrietta Tennis Association is prepared to pay for the construction of the four new post-tension concrete courts, an estimated cost of $164,000. This amounts to approximately 76% of the cost for the project we're presenting tonight. With your approval, we believe the Henrietta Economic Development Authority will commit to pay for the fencing, the backboard, and the lights. The head of funds would pay for 24% of, of this project and would total approximately $51,252. With this project, the City of Henrietta will be receiving a major facility upgrade of almost a quarter of a million dollars. The new facility will open up more opportunities to host tennis clinics, school team tournaments, and summer program events that can all bring people to Henrietta. James and Connie McCullough are donating the lot east of the tennis courts to the city at no cost. Our group recently purchased the lot to the south of the backboard. This lot is being cleaned up, improved, and will be given to the city in the future at no cost. These lots give us room to expand and improve this facility and we hope to acquire more properties in the future as they become available. A beautiful tennis facility, a beautiful public tennis facility on Main Street should also help our city promote itself as a better place to live and raise a family. This should help our city leaders as they try to attract more businesses to Henrietta. The social benefits of getting this project completed will be every bit as important as the financial benefits. Improving public facilities and parks will make Henrietta a more pleasant, sociable place to live. Good public facilities in prime locations can help protect our kids by providing them with more options for their healthy activities. 
all of Henrietta's future kids will have the opportunity to learn the game of tennis at this site for free, just like they have for over 50 consecutive years. With this opportunity and some hard work, some of our kids may even earn college scholarships, like many have in the past. In closing, Coach Mike Kennedy, James McCullough, Connie McCullough, Joan Milligan, Coach Mark Milligan, Stan Swyden, Johnny Truesdale, and I have worked on this project for well over a year. We think this project can be a model example of how the city leaders of Henrietta and a group of its citizens can work together to build something very special for our community. With your approval of our project tonight, and with the Henrietta Economic Development Authority as our partner, we would like to follow the guidance of City Manager Graham and build Henrietta a new facility at 12th and Main this year. Thank you very much. James is going to come and show you some pictures and let you see a little bit of what we're doing. And we'd be very happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you for that. Basically what you're seeing is a fly-through of the uh, court facility as it will look hopefully in the next uh, year or so as we uh, continue to work on the project and uh, try to put everything together. Right now it uh, shows you basically what our plans are right uh, at this point in time to be able to give you a sense of the, the look of it overall. So uh, it does at this point in time include bathroom and also a pavilion but those are in our next couple of stages that we're going to do. Part of the uh, lot that we purchased behind the area will be for parking. As there was some concern about losing parking. Actually, we're going to gain quite a bit. So we, uh, we feel it's a win-win it's a on that. Yeah, that Anybody have any questions? Looks like a pretty well thought out plan to me. Any comments, any discussion amongst the council? I get total support of this proposal by the Tennis Association for a number of reasons. These men and women have went out and collected over 75% of the requirements to make themselves. Uh, the association has been a part of this city for over 50 years. They have provided a service to our community that no other town or city in this state that I can find provides. Many children's lives have been directly affected and changed by this organization and its dedication to our community. Many high school students have been awarded scholarships because they started playing tennis on these courts when they were very young. These young men and women have gone on to receive college degrees they may not have been able to get otherwise. It is, if this project is, is not done, the program as we know it will not exist in five years or less it, because the facilities will just not be there. Upgrading the facility will set the stage in conditions for future successes and allow the association and our school to bring in bigger and better tournaments and ultimately bring in some people to our community. Uh, th this project, along with the McCutcheon Park improvements already funded, represent the beginning of our Parks Improvement Program and will go a long ways towards improving the appearance of our west end of the Main Street. It, if our community is unwilling to invest in itself, uh, we obviously cannot expect anybody else to invest in it. Thank you for that, Ted. Any further discussion? I think it's great for the kids. Anything we do for, for the young and dear in town is what we need to do. But they don't have anything to do, so I think it's great. And it would be a huge asset to be able to see when you pull into town. Just got the, as far as tennis courts, I can't think James. of another facility where this guy's right on the main street. Absolutely. It's just amazing. For the benefit of the people that are here. Oh, oh turn sure. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so let's you look for a moment. And, uh, any further discussion? <laughs> Mr. Johnson, anything else? Just, will, will you continue to have your relationship with the Lions Club of Henrietta in the fundraising? And we'll, one of the things was is we were talking about the advertising and the signs, and maybe how we could come up with a concept to fit both of our needs. Yeah, we were talking to Mr. McAfee about that just earlier, and that would definitely be something that we would be, be talking about. Ideally, it would be nice to, to keep that funding. There's, there's been some concern here just of the, the look of it, how it would be prettier, possibly, without all the signage. Okay. Uh, and some of our donors have expressed that interest. You know, if there was a way to do it without just covering it up, you know, where people could drive by and you'd actually look in and see the courts. Um, 
So I think there's possibilities that we can look at to do that. And Mr. McAfee was mentioning to me earlier, possibly a way even to put some of the signage on that east lot that we're, the McCullough's are giving to us. And you might be able to put it there and maybe to make the signs a little smaller and, and do certain things to keep that. Because uh, obviously it's been a great funding for us uh, to help take care of that. We hope at the very minimum we're also going to supplement that a lot in the future with more funding for the summer program. Now that we're getting organized with this, we plan, we've talked to a lot of our donors already. Uh, after we get this all done, the facility's built, you know, we hope to come up with a good list of 75 or 100 people who will all give 100 to $500 a year. And we hit them with an email in April, and they send that in, and now we have that money going into the summer program. And if we still have the signage going with the Lions Club, that could just go with that. Um, we'd like to expand the summer program as much as we can. You know, right now, we're... We're doing really the minimum there, I think. You know, right now, uh, I know when I was a kid, when Dr. Smith was in charge of everything there, uh, we were actually receiving some funding to help go to tournaments and to do other things. Right now, I think we pretty much give some lessons, and, and, and it's really good. But it'd be nice, you know, if we can get all our donors back involved, and get them, you know, maybe we can put some more money into that, uh, maybe even get a little more instruction going in the afternoons, and also pay somebody to take some of our kids to tournaments. I know when I was a kid, Mr. Kennedy, uh, we, we literally went coast to coast with tournaments, and Dr. Smith was helping us with that. So we hope to get past this big stage and then go back to our donors and say, hey, now let's, let's keep this thing going, let's get it really organized, and now let's start really uh, putting more of the money then into helping the kids. That answers me. Yes, sir. The, um, the other question I had just for the benefit of the people is, the, could you explain briefly the post-tension concrete and why it's so important for the courts and its longevity? Yeah, the post-tension is, and I can't explain the exact process as well, <coughs> so don't do it, um, but they will come in and they're going to put on our courts, they can come in and build these courts right on top of our courts. We don't have to tear these courts up or anything. They're going to come in, they're going to put about four inches of sand, on top of that there's going to be about a four inch layer of what they call post-tension concrete. It's an overlay. Uh, what they do, they come in and they put cables and they tighten the concrete and they get it so tight that if it does try to crack, it won't. You may see little hairline cracks, but then it can't continue to expand. Um, so, like right now, the court's down there right now. I walked on again there just a couple hours ago, and literally we have cracks like this. Okay, with a good post-tension slab, you can come back 20 years from now, and you, you may see a little hairline crack, but it can't expand. And then at that point, you know, 10 or every 10 or 15 years, you come in and just resurface. It looks brand new, and it's literally like a new facility. Uh, so the post tension is the way to go. It's that facility's past time of patching and fixing because it, it just it's just not going to work anymore. But if we do this post tension slab like James and Coach Kennedy and I've talked about, um, the next time this facility needs some work, we'll all be long gone. Okay, <laughs> this is done right. It's going to be there and it'll be there for the duration. Thank you. Thank you. Any yeah. further discussion? Over council, please. Clayson. Yes. Cole. Yes. Kelzer. Yes. Cole. Yes. Goodner. Yes. Discussion on setting the speed limit on Main Street. I've had a number of people have approached me about the speed limit, and, and I had some concerns too uh, about particularly the east end of town where the speed limit's up to 35, and typically people are doing closer to 40, and trying to get in and out of Walmart, places like that, especially if you're coming across trying to go east or west, can be a can be a problem. And uh, but I've talked with Ted about this, and it's probably not a doable deal. And I'll turn it over to Ted now and explain why the the uh, well the situation we're in with higher government that sometimes seems to strangle us. But at any rate, Ted, if you'd let them know why we can't, we probably won't be able to do anything about the speed limit well, on the main street. I mean, we we can attempt it. The, the process is controlled by the Department of Transportation of Oklahoma because it is a alternate B business state highway. And so they have control of that. And then the process would be is basically we would ask Mr. Saliba with the Muskogee 
ODOT office to do a speed study, which is an entailed speed study that takes a lot of resources. And traditionally, it's been their findings that speed studies don't indicate that we need to go down. They actually show that we need to go up. We all seem to be excessive. And, um, and so that process is in there. And then there is a set format. And it's a very cumbersome format to lower it to 25. The accident ratios are put into that, the, the speeds, slower speeds can cause them. Mr. Saliba is going to share with us a basically a sheet that shows the process and what all that's in there. It's a cumbersome. The simple thing is also is there, you know, like I said, they would be willing to discuss with the city is if we would want to remove Main Street from the state highway system and we would take total control of that. And, and there would be some real reasons not to and maybe some reasons to, but the reasons not to, as you've seen, was an overlay that happened. That was all done with state highway funding. And so those things would in, in, encumber into that. He was reluctant to go down the path of lowering the speed limit. There is a process. It's a very cumbersome process. And he said that even in the end, when the engineering got done with it, they probably would not recommend to go that low. Um, and they have looked at some of that. But where traffic counts are high, um, I think we're at about 8,800 average count. Um, and it is 35 miles an hour. And uh, so when you lower it 10 miles an hour, he said you would have to have the engineers and all the things that are in there. And it takes a lot of his resources. Um, he did not share that with me tonight. I was hoping he might even be here in person to discuss it. We can have him come and, and talk about those things. But um, he said it was extremely unlikely that we would get the ability to lower it 10 miles an hour down Main Street. And, and that there's this process involved. And, and, and then I wanted everybody to understand you could remove it. I, I guess I would recommend that we not remove it from the state process. Um, but we would want to weigh all of those things and, uh, and talk about them. Um, so those are the, the things that are, there is a process in play that you would have to go through and he, he would want to meet with us and discuss how that begins and where that goes and how much that would take and what it would entail to get to there. And it's a long process. He said it would take quite a while also to accomplish. So, thank you, Ted. We're huh? not, we're not yeah. captains of our own yeah, ship. It, 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 is a, it is not a free project, so I don't know what if he, if they have to do that or if we would have to share in that. But, I, I mean, that would be something to discuss if we want to go down it um, and do so, that. Anyway, that's, that's where we're at on the speed limit, which means probably nothing will happen. Item 6, discussion on Nichols Park improvements. Ted, did you want to... Um, take the lead on that. Yeah, uh, I had talked to a company that is basically called Wibbit or Sports Parks. Um, for those of you that may or may not be familiar with a park in Eufaula called the, um, uh, I call it Jelly Bean Park or, uh, excuse me, Yogi Bear, Yogi Bear Park. And um, they have a floating device, and I'll pass this around and then we can pass it around to people. They're going to come and do a presentation. and. Um, these are devices that float on water, and you can do any, you can pass it to the audience. All of us have seen, I have several emails, and, and, and do that. Um, it's an obstacle course, and they are, they come in multiple sizes, as you'll see in these catalogs and these pictures that they have. And they come in different sizes, different formats. You can have slides, you can have trampolines, bouncing devices. And the idea being is that we would incorporate our lake at Nichols, as it had been in the past, into a swimming park in a place where people could go and, and have fun. And uh, I've been to this with my family at Eufaula, and, and it was um, actually fun to be on, and it was actually fun to do. And uh, I think it, and you can thumb through the pages. There's multiple. Uh, I did not know that there was this many things out there that you can do with the, those kind of devices and um, it would basically build us a portable swim park and they are air up devices they blow up they're made out of a thick PVC material they're very hard to puncture they're very hard to so it just takes some maintenance do they la I don't know the exact lifespan of them um, but they come in everything from basically about a two thousand dollar investment to a two hundred thousand dollar investment so the sky's kind of the limit, and, and you can pick and match and, and do any kind of a configuration. And like all of these places, they have a deal where they can take your actual layout of your leg 
and configure that and make it a, how it would lay out and how it would perform and what the best way to anchor and the best positions to put those devices in. Um, and so I thought that was a, a, a great way to move forward with looking at how we get some form of a water park, if you will, um, with not as much cost. Um, if you've built any swimming pools lately, um, they're extremely expensive. Um, and, and I would be the first to tell you we would love to have a swimming pool here. As most of you know, my girls competitively swim. But um, they're huge investments when you start building concrete or putting buildings around them. And so this is an alternative that I think allows for a tourism build, more importantly. Um, my idea would be is how do we get people to come and do a motel stay or a restaurant buy or to spend some time here in Henrietta. And I think this brings not only our local people, it brings people in our family. So when they come, we have an entertainment device that we can send them to. Um, I've, I've, the only one I've been to is the one in follow. There's a couple others that you can go to. Um, and so... They're a lot of fun, and I think for the dollar, they're an investment that you can look at, and they're feasible for us to accomplish. And uh, it doesn't take a lot of manpower, but you do have to man them. I think you would have to offer, and I know that everybody 16 years and younger would have to be made available to a life jacket. There'd have to be some oversight in there. You can't just say, oh, here it is, see ya. Um, the one that you follow park is $10 an individual. I thought it was relatively inexpensive, but they do offer more than what I'm talking about. They have a, a regular swimming pool and they have a small putt-putt golf. Um, I don't play, so I haven't done that yet. And um, um, So there is some amenities there, but um, I think those are some of the discussion items that we need to have. As most of you know, many people in the room were on a strategic planning deal about quality of life, parks, park improvements, Henrietta improvements, and this is one idea. And so what the mayor had asked me to do was to bring this discussion up, try to see about having a presentation, and start talking about how you would implement something like this at Nichols, and, and kind of get that back on everybody's horizon and get it back into a use that I think would work all summer. And I think, I don't know exactly how long, but I think you could go five months here pretty easy with it, depending on the weather. Um, the one in follow, I think you can have somewhere between... Um, 100 to 200 people on it all the time. Um, the day that I took my family the first time, there was 500 tickets sold while I was there. Um, not all of us were obviously on the devices, but um, it, it was there, and it was a lot of fun, um, even for those of us that are not actively water happy, and um, I don't pursue a lot of sun, but um, I enjoyed it with my kids and thought it was a, a good time. They have um, all kinds of devices that you can add into there. You could expand this at some point to Jim Hall Lake if you so decided. There's other things you could do with it like that. Um, I just thought it was something that we could start down the discussion path. It's part of what we've been talking about in that committee and parks improvements. It's one facet of it. We've been talking about tournament style softball and baseball fields. We're talking about playground equipment that fits different age groups at different parks. We're talking about offering soccer or play fields that would just be incorporated into communities and one of the things that are on the agenda tonight are splash pads, something that um, offers a community a quality of life aspect. And I, I think you take on those things and you look at them and this is one night to discuss about how you take on something that is uniquely different and we have the asset that's readily made to fit that devices that are there. And I think you can incorporate it quickly. And, and I say quickly, nothing we do in city government is quick. So when I say that, don't expect me to buy that tomorrow. Um, but I do think it's something that we can start looking at here in the next either six months or a year and look at how we would go about that and then how we would staff it or if we would lease the management of that out. And uh, we have spent an enormous amount of time on that committee and we've looked at a multiple of deals. The mayor seems to be excited about it. Most of the people I show it to seem, I can share emails with you. I have all of these in an email if you want to look at all these. And they have YouTube videos if you want to go see them in actual action. Um, they're phenomenal for the dollar invested in them. And I think they incorporate a quality of life here that we could use over and over again. And it fits a large age band. Um, I, I was teasing my mother the other day, it's 2 to 92, because she said she wouldn't be interested. Um, but <laughs> So I, I had to encompass her age all of a sudden in my discussion with her. And so, 
Um, <clears throat> but when she's seen it and she looked at it, you know, that she's not going to go on it because we've tried mightily to get her to go before. But um, um, she understood the value and, and she, she goes with our kids to other parks and she's taken them to other swim parks. And so I think this is something that is a huge asset and it's, it's the discussion and it's the initial step for everybody to look at and see the co a concept, I guess. Mm -hmm. And the concept, I think, is easily done, and um, we just happen to have the lake standing there in front of us, and, and we can all talk about the history, but I think this is a way to move forward with making it an asset and making it a value to the community. And doing it with, and don't get me wrong, I don't, I don't mean to say, but it, it, it's, it's not as significant as building a water park that is made of concrete and put in there. Um, and so this is a way to do that. And it, I think it's it's more valuable to those people that just want to play and have fun in reality than having a normal swimming pool, um, if you will. And so this is a, a huge value, and, and I just think it's worth looking at. If you want me to share those emails with you, just send me something or ask, and I'll be glad to send them. If you want to go to YouTube, that's where I first started looking them up. Just go to YouTube. They'll show you an actual live um, value, and I think you'll like them. Um, I just think they have a huge value to this community, and I think we can incorporate this, and I, you know, within the next year or so to get this done. Thank you, Ted. One of the nice things I was really impressed with those things is how modular they are. You can start fairly modestly if you need to, and then depending on demand, you can build on to them. Now, this is the early stages of this thing, and uh, I think that it's, it's got a ton of potential. And I think one of the important things that we all want to keep in mind here is that uh, we're, we're the council, the city, uh, and the other, uh, well, the other organizations around town, we're starting to talk about these things now, trying to get things done for, for so long, it seems like. We just sort of set in the business as usual. So whether or not we, this is a success uh, remains to be seen. I think it will. At least we're going to give it a very good try. So... From that perspective, I'm, I'm uh, excited and impressed about where we're going and the possibilities we have. Hey, Bill. So thanks again, Ted. If I can give you a, a taste of reality, we've discussed it at, at length with this ad hoc group of people we've talked about, and there are some, and, and and we've looked at the lake a lot because of exactly what what we're talking about here. We see great potential there, but there are some there are some practical things that have to be discussed. One thing is. Is, is there's not a beach there yet. It, you know, putting the beach there is not a cheap endeavor. Okay, it, it is not an inexpensive proposition. There are some there are some sewer issues there, and we, we have a bathhouse, uh, which you all know the condition of the bathhouse. You all have seen it, and so consequently, you got to make some decisions about what to do with that bathhouse. It, you know, the cost to bring that bathhouse back to the condition that it was when it was in its pristine. Is, is in the six figures, okay? It, it's, not, it's not an inexpensive proposition. And, and there's a lot of nostalgia there, but at the same time, you have to talk about what's the practical thing to do. Is e Even though it's on the National Historic Register, we don't have to restore it, okay? We could actually tear it down, bite my tongue, okay? But, but that's, that's possible, but it would have to be different. <laughs> There's Be a lot careful. Of <laughs> 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 you don't talk about the good stuff. I'm giving you a taste of reality. Get away from me, Henry. Don't stay close to me. I understand what you're saying. And these are We're the all from here. <laughs> I understand that. I'm just you telling you. The, the, I'm looking at this from the practical yeah. standpoint because there is a practicality to this that you have to look at. And, and, how badly do you want this is the question. Do you want it badly enough yeah. to invest to invest the the quarter million or more that you're talking about here? And that quarter million ain't even these things. These things are the cheap things. Right. True. Okay, these are the cheap things, okay? So, you know, well, I ain't saying yay or nay what I would do, but I'm just telling you guys from a standpoint of the public, make sure you take into account all there is to it, because it isn't just going out and buying some process. floaties and sticking them in the water. You know? Yeah, it's not an easy process, and the money isn't there. So yeah. It's a matter so of finding money and figuring out. If it's easy, it's already been done. But you bring up the practical aspects of, well, the restroom facilities. If we're going to have that many people and, out and, there, and, and, and there are places, like that. there are parks, there are parks who have facilities like this who actually use Johnny on the jobs, okay? Yeah. Now, now, that is not necessarily the primo way to do this. 
but there are people that do this. There are places that do this. Well, that might be an inexpensive, easy way in if it develops, if we've got the demand. As long as you expand. offer hand wash facilities, decent sure. hand wash facilities, and a decent shower facility, an outdoor shower facility. Okay. Well, this is very early stages, and there's a lot of things we're going to have to resolve to get there, but at least we're going to be trying to get there. And so, moving that direction. I think it would be great to have the city manager to have the people come and explain it to them. Yeah, he, he had asked them. They couldn't. They had a scheduling problem and couldn't get here for that this meeting. meeting. Whatever we need to do that. Yeah, so, and and also the management of it is, is, is another thing. You know, we, we, the city, I absolutely am totally opposed to the city managing any business, okay? Business management is not what this city should be doing, or any city, that they just shouldn't do it. It, it needs to be managed uh, just like our, our tennis park down here that that's going to be built ultimately. The, the vision for that is, is to give a long-term lease, because this property is all going to belong to the city, but they give a long-term lease to the Tennis Association at no cost. They, they do the maintenance on it. We do the major maintenance, but they keep the courts maintained, keep it cleaned up, trees trimmed, etc., that sort of stuff. Okay. But we really, it's you know, possible we could tie this to the uh, the ball fields. It, it is possible. Park, and have, have one and organization and running. Anyway, those are long term plans, and we'll be right. talking about. But those are all just practical things road. that yeah. you have to look at because there's practical side to this. You know, yeah. it is it's and gee whiz, but well, if we're going to make it work, the practical side of it has to be taken into account. Yeah. Good point, uh, Henry. I have some additional for Nichols. Um, I did just so everybody knows the docks are there, and there's one there that needs some repair, and then there's one that it needs. What I think is a total replacement, and so I mimicked what you have, and so the the, the fishing or the floating dock or, or the what I call the viewable dock that floats, it's on a hundred foot walkway, six foot wide, and the dock is actually forty foot long, twelve foot wide with a ten foot e height, and there's a company here locally where I it's you follow, and so I talked to him about building them, and they are built off of the state um, fish and game pa pattern. And they're built out of total galvanized, so they'll last quite a while on water. And they're built with a floating styrofoam deck. And basically, if you put them 100 foot off of water, <laughs> 6 foot wide, similar to that, they're roughly between 42,000 and 52,000 per dock. And, uh, and the reason why I bring that up is that it leads to the Jim Hall Lake, where there was two <laughs> or three that existed at one time. And we've been talking about replacing those. And I found some old paperwork. And so they're not far off in their bid because that's kind of the investment that existed back in the day. And um, unfortunately, a tornado or a windstorm or a, a whatever happened to those on Jim Hall Lake tore those up. But if you exactly built them 40 foot long, 12 foot wide, and those of us that are from dry land, I had to ask why they were so big. And it's for the amount of people that would be on them and to keep them from tipping so much. So since I'm not on water a lot, I didn't take that into concept because I thought 12 by 16 would just make this thing go away. And he didn't recommend building them that small because they tip quite a bit with a certain amount of weight on them. And I had not given that any concept or any idea until he had kind of talked to me about it. Um, he did say, though, that you could go to a four foot wide and you could also place them closer, but it's all relevant to water depth and the fishing or the habitat and what you're doing. But I presumed in the pictures that I have available on the Jim Hall Lake that they also were about a hundred foot off of shore, looking at the pictures and trying to estimate. You know, six um, feet wide is ADA compliant too. Uh, he thought we could get away with four foot six, but I, I, I'm not sure. So that's what I told him I had to look into from a public aspect with the ADA <laughs> compliancy. But the ones that exist today are the only one that exists today, and the other ones look identical to that that we have. We have some remnants of these storm damaged ones. They were 40 foot long, 12 foot wide, and the decks were the, the 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 walkways are about six foot by 100 foot. The one on Nichols Lake is exactly 91 feet long, um, and, and so I've measured all of them, and I know the exact eve height. We could also change. It has a pitched roof, and he said one way to save money is put a flat roof and just angle it so water runs off one side or the other, and, and that made perfect sense too. And so there's all there's some concepts to talk about, but. So I've been going down the path, and, and I think the dock that exists on Nichols, unless otherwise, I think we ought to replace the one that's wooden on poles with a floating dock. That way it is kind of manageable and movable. The one right now is on big open poles that are rotting, and we'd have to either take them out or replace them. And uh, he said they would be significantly more expensive to put in <coughs> a, a pier deck, is what they are, and uh, put those in there if you put them back. 
And the floating made sense to me. You could kind of manage the movement of it if you so desired at some point. But um, you could put it off of the corner. I don't know if it has to be 100 foot off of that corner. But anyway, that's something to talk about. And that was what I was going down. I was looking at replacing the existing dock on the dam, which is the southwest corner of the lake, and putting a floating apparatus there and, um, and doing that. So those are something that we're moving forward with and looking at. But roughly, you know, it's, it's going to take about $45,000 to build a floating device of that size. And the galvanized causes some of that investment. But I've looked at some alternatives, been on YouTube and looked at what you can build. And, um, and so we got those things. But that's making them look all the same and making them look like what you had. And I found the grant paperwork that existed from the ones that were here before. And that's the exact size they were, 40 foot by 12 foot with the 6 foot walkways on them. And that's what was in place at the time. And so that's kind of what I priced to start at. And so, you know, we'd like to do those things and, re and refurbish them and then put them out there. But another discussion item, another moving forward. I'm not sure how many of you have driven out to Nichols or to Jim Hall Lake and looked. The forestry department, our local fire department, have done an amazing job. They've burned all of that off. It looks so good. good if you haven't been out there, go look. It's worth your time. And the spillway, Eddie Thomas painted both sides of it to cover up graffiti, had help from the mayor and his wife and others that came out and helped her paint. But go look at that. It looks very nice. Both lakes and then of course the clearing that they did down here at 75 and it looks amazing. You see that on that? Yeah. <laughs> you can see us from I-40 yeah. and 75. Yeah. The Jim Hall Lake is where the paintings are on the spillway. So. Yeah. Thank you for that, Ted. Uh, item 7, discussion on the Henry Splash Pad at McCutcheon Park. Uh, does anybody have anything they want to present on mm -hmm. that? I'd like to talk about that okay. myself. Uh, I've had a lot of flack about it being in the, the location of the scene. And what I think we ought to do is put it out there on the south side of Nichols Park by the uh, house out there. And uh, in doing so, we could use the water out of the lake instead of using city water, which is treated water, and it costs us money to treat that water, okay? And it'll probably go back in the sewer lines. I don't see any storm drains or anything up there. And you've got to treat it going out then, and so it will cost you. Now, I don't know exactly how much it is a minute that it uses. I heard six gallons a minute. If that's the case, that's 360 gallons an hour, and if you have a 10 hours a day, that's 3,600 gallons. Now that's what the average home in Henrietta uses a month, between three and 4,000 gallons of water. If you do it 100 days, that's 360,000 gallons at the worst way of doing things. You could go out there and with a pipe coming out of the water up to a pump, and you don't have a holding tank, and you could use that, and all you'd be out would be the electricity of the pump. And in doing so, you're doing this for children that are from two years old to eight years old, these flash pads. But you could go out there and you could put some sand down and you could make a, a, a um, volleyball court. You could pull a pad out there and make a half court basketball thing. You could put a, a uh, miniature golf course out there. You could do a lot of things, and it wouldn't cost millions and half a millions and all that. You could do it for a few thousand dollars. It makes some good points, Jenny. Uh, I don't know that it's cast in stone that it goes in the kitchen, but uh, the, the, one of the, the issues I remember was one of the issues, if, if, I, if I could make this one comment, one of the issues I remember that there was a serious concern about was, was vandalism. We put it out there until we get well, we finish, until we get Nichols Park secure. Because I do remember when uh, uh, the, I think it was the Parks Board put uh, uh, commodes in out there, and I think they lasted two days till they got torn up. So well, I'm not saying that was that, that was a, a point of concern, I believe, from the group that decided to put it where it's going. If you put cameras out there, and you need cameras when you got some activity going on that can cause an accident. You got to be able to get a recording of it, okay? And that'll save you some liability, maybe. Okay? 
And if you close that gate on the south side at dark or a time period, and if you go on the north side, and before that road splits, put another gate there and close it at the same time you do this one, there, you can't drive a car in there. If you want to vandalize, you got to walk in there to vandalize. You make some good points. I don't know that it's cast in stone and it goes with the, the, the Park, decision the group to revisit. If I can pop in about the decision, yeah. the decision to put it in McCutcheon Park centered on two things the, the vandalism issue, but even more importantly than that was the fact that it is for young children. Young children are not going to go to McCutcheon Park on their own. Many parents work in the day, they can't take kids to the park. Uh, it just, they just, it will get underutilized. If we want this thing to be used, McCutcheon Park is. It is not centrally located in the city simply because of the fact it's on top of the hill, but I guarantee you that place will be packed every day because kids will walk to that thing every day. There's no doubt in my mind. And they, they might if they live there, but them kids down at the, at the one going out of Lake Road, there's a apartment complex out there, they're not going to walk there. If you got with kids, then make a scheduled run with definite stops where they could get on every hour or every two hours or something. You mean like cats well, or something? Huh? You mean a, a deli a, like a bus route or something? Yeah, yeah. Uh, they got equipment that caused probably 15 people at a time or maybe more than that. You can go out there for a dollar and stay out there all day and come back for a dollar. Uh, I don't know. You make some good points, Denny. I'm well, sure that the group, well, let me make this point. That the group that, that, that gave this a fair amount of thought and decided on McCutcheon Park, and uh, uh, I suppose they could always revisit it. I don't see why not. But they did, do, they did decide that that's where it was going to be. We had a council vote, and we had unanimous approval to, to put it there. We, let me finish. We then agreed to a contract. And I'm assuming that the contract, the, the pricing and everything had to do with the location where they were putting it in at McCutcheon. It, so right now we're kind of locked into there, I believe. It's not much for that splash pad, whether it goes there or there. Okay. It's the same money. Okay. The problem you have out there, though, is actually water. Because this thing requires 60 PSI, minimum 60 PSI to work. Uh, and the city would have to furnish the pump. These people don't put the pump in. So there's another seven to $10,000 for the pump, okay? electricity that has to be run to it put it out there. So it, you can know, you it, pump it, dirty water? You, can, and, 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 and also, you can't use the lake water to do it. I'm going to tell you, I've lived in that lake for years and years, and I, I never too. got sick or anything. But for the pump to work, you can't put algae in But you can't you put it. You got a filter. You, you can filter it just like no, anything. No, but it's going to cost thousands of dollars to run that over years with the treated water coming in and the treated water going out. It's going to cost our city to the water regardless. It's going to cost our city somewhere. No, it should. You don't have to treat the water regardless. No, you don't own the space. Well, <laughs> public involved in the water. I think, uh, I think it's treated just it. like a swimming pool. Uh, yeah, I think it's, not, it's not a good idea to build one there and then have one down. It, I've heard it talking about two or three in time. I, I would support that. But if over time, possibly. Over time, yeah, and it's going to cost well, a lot of money. Cost. And y'all are talking about millions of dollars, I think. Yeah. This is not a million dollars. You can redo the south side of that lake and make a nice place out of it. You're going to have that uh, frisbee duff stuff over there and all that kind of stuff. And there will be a lot of people going out there and use it. And eventually that will happen. I appreciate your position, Dave. Well, well, not at least a dollar. Okay. We're running water. Well, this is a, folks, this is a discussion only. I think that we probably made all the points that we need to make on it. You, and, and you bring up some good points, Denny, that I'm sure the group, the, the committee, will, will revisit that and, and see if, there, if it makes any sense. But for now, I think we've talked about everything that we need to about that, but there's no, nothing, nothing that is going to come of us sitting here and, and continue to beat that around. So shall we move to the next item? Uh, item 8, uh, is Dr. Glidden here? He's right there. Okay, would you like to make a, a presentation on the effects of this artificial marijuana? And we appreciate your coming down, sir. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for having me. 
Um, the reason that I'm here is we had an incident recently at the hospital where we had an individual come in that was quite uh, disturbed mentally. Uh, and in the course of the conversation, it turns out that he had obtained some of the so-called fake marijuana, K2 spices, lots of names. We all know, I think, what we're talking about. And uh, he, he obtained it from a local merchant. And I had somebody about a month or so ago, same story, obtained it from another local merchant, of course, under the counter, because everybody knows it's not good. Now, I talked to the police chief, as a matter of fact, that was there at the time for the second incident. I asked him, I said, how is it that this is sold in town? This is illegal in this state. I think it was made illegal about a year or so ago. And his response was, well, there's nothing we can do about it because we don't know exactly what it is. Now, a little bit of background. This is a, a designer drug. Uh, basically, these chemists have taken the basic active ingredient of marijuana, and then they've changed it a little bit. Well, unfortunately, the way that works with so-called designer drugs is the, the authorities can make this particular substance illegal, but then a chemist comes in and tweaks it a little bit and changes one little side group, and all of a sudden, it's not covered under the law. And I think that's the point that the police uh, were making. Apparently, this was also presented to the city attorney, who was uh, apparently, by what I was told, there's nothing we can do about this. Now, I just don't accept that, okay? This is a public health menace. People in our town are being adversely affected by this illegal substance that's being sold boldly right here in town. And I'd like to know why we can't do anything about it. And, and that's just not acceptable. I mean, what if it's one of your relatives? Well, one of the things that we've given us some thought, I visited with Ted about it some before, uh, we, well, when we knew you were coming, and what I think we'd like to do is after this meeting, the word will be out to the people that are selling it that they really ought to stop that. And what we intend to do is give them, a, say, a two-week grace period, 30 days or whatever, and then we're going to start publishing the names of all of the uh, retail outlets that are selling this stuff, everybody that we can find. And maybe that'll uh, be enough pressure on it that they'll stop. I, I don't know by a report of the one two that I know of, Kearns Corner and uh, Johnny Appleseed. You know, that may or may not be true. I don't know that for a fact. This is just what was reported to me. Um, I don't have any reason to doubt them. I mean, these people would have no reason to lie. So. Um, I was thinking if there isn't anything that can be done legally, then just a public shame campaign, I think, would be. Well, exactly. What, was the, what were the symptoms? What were the problems? Was it long-term? Was it serious problems? Well, of course, we don't know. I mean, I just saw these people acutely, but there are widespread reports about the damage that this causes, and it's usually of a psychological nature. Um, and quite honestly, it, it, you know, people that aren't, pardon the expression, wrapped too tight to begin with, they're going to have problems with any kind of mind-altering mm -hmm. substance. But the problem with this particular thing is that nobody knows exactly what it is. These chemists that cook these things up, they don't do clinical trials to see how this affects people. They tweak it a little bit so they can stay one step ahead of the law, and then they just put it out there. This stuff is pretty expensive, too. I think it's like $30 or $40 for just a little packet. Now, I don't know how much profit they make from this. It's obviously profitable. And they obviously know they shouldn't be doing it because they don't just display it, you know, openly, they hide it, and then they expect people to come in that the word spreads, oh, they can get it here. And Has this been going on long? I don't, think I, I don't know how long it's been going on, frankly, but, it, you know, it's going on right now. Yes, it is. Well, and, and, you know, we need to put a stop to it, one way or the other, because somebody's going to get, some other people, beyond those who already have, are going to get hurt from this. Well, I think tonight we'll just serve notice that anybody that continues to sell this stuff, we're going to make it public knowledge. And maybe the, the shame factor, whatever, we're going to start doing it. Doc, is there anything else? That's all I have well, to we say. We sure appreciate you coming down. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Well, have you begun to obtain the language to write an ordinance? Um, there's not many ordinances that exist, and, and so I have addressed or tried to address your system. Talk to them municipally. There's not an ordinance in the state. It, the law went into effect November 2014, the first. And um, so I've asked and for other language. There is some language that we got from Florida um, on an ordinance that they have. And, and so we've been working, trying to articulate or format an ordinance that would fit what we could do and how we could do it. And so 
it's not that we don't do anything. I don't want it to be like we're not doing anything, but you got to do it right if you're going to do it. I also know that there's things that we can't divulge that are happening, and um, but I think it is being addressed. Um, we're not the only city addressing it. I know that we talked to some of the surrounding Tulsa metro area, and they're trying to address it also. So through the municipal league, we've been trying to come up with a way that we can put together an ordinance that fits so that we can make that happen. But the chemical derivatives, I don't know how to address how they change it and alter it quickly like that. Um, but I do know that it's been looked at, and I do know that the other agencies involved have looked at it, and we just haven't been able to, I guess, catch those people at the right spot at the right time. And I will say also from the legal standpoint, that is the problem in enforcing this, even from the Oklahoma Bureau of, Narcot Bureau of Narcotics cannot keep up with these changes. Currently, what has to happen for enforcement purposes is that there has to be a chemist come in and test whatever is purchased, and then that chemist has to give the report that yes, it fits within the framework of the statute. So whatever those prohibited ingredients are, they have to fit that. If they have had the chemical derivative to them, and it does not fit within a specific framework, then it is not an illegal substance under that law. So they have to go through. So it's extremely expensive to go in and try and prove on a case-by-case -case basis. And from a city standpoint, you'd have to have a chemist um, come in and, and testify. The other issue that we have is that we are not a court of record. We can only charge $500. Basically, there's some things that we can charge more but you would not be able to get the cost back even through a fine for, for doing, you know, one, even the call to the chemist would cost you over that to get that in there. So we've got a situation uh, from an enforcement standpoint, even the state is sitting there scratching their heads going, how can we get this stopped? This new law hopefully will add some teeth to it, but I think that the public shame needs to work because I know that it is devastating. I know from a personal level that it is devastating. I would love to be able to get out there and stop it and shut all of it down. And the profit is there, six figures in three or four months um, because people are, are buying it. Uh, I've thought about that, Luann. Would it, could we put, a, say, a licensing requirement and, and make it a, a, this category of some sort of uh, chemical substances, and if you to sell it, it cost you ten thousand bucks to buy a license. Could we do anything like that? I, I don't I know that you can. You're still in the same situation of determining what those chemicals are. Uh, the sales need to be banned. Uh, we yeah. need to ban them. If we can, if we can determine what it is and can identify it somehow, we can yeah, you ban it within a certain zone. Yeah. You can't just say, well, here, you can sell this potentially dangerous chemical, mm -hmm. but it's going to cost you $10,000 yeah. to do it. I don't think you can do that. Yeah, no, it, it would have to be <laughs> Just out of a sheer curiosity, doctor, is it a rampant epidemic thing that you deal with in the hospital? or And, uh, and it's no. just sheer morbid curiosity on my point. Oh, you don't want to get me on my soapbox. <laughs> um, just a little background. I don't know if you all know, but my wife and I own and operate Tiger Mountain Recovery, which is a drug and alcohol. And I worked 10 years at vision program at the hospital, so I've got quite an interest in this. Now, this is just small potatoes compared to the overall opiate addiction problem that we experience. We're number one, by the way, in this state. Us in Alabama are vying for number one for the uh, sheer number of opiate uh, abuse, uh, the amount of opiate abuse that goes on in this, in this country. But, no, this is a small problem. But I've seen two Henry Adams that have been adversely affected by this, so I think it's very important, and it's going on just boldly in our community. I know that we have gotten, and it's not something that just steadily stays there. You know, somebody will hear about it, this will get talked about, it'll be a public thing, people keep their eyes on it, and then two years down the road, it kind of creeps back in, you know, we'll hear about it, because this isn't the first time that we've had reports. I've had it come to the freelance before where they said, well, I want you to go post up here, and I want you to go to cover, and I want you to try to buy it, and I want you to catch these guys, and it's like, you know, what are you going to do? They know who you are. They're not going to sell it to me, you know. Like, oh. you know they, it's not going to work. Well, it is a problem. It is a problem. Thank you again, Doctor. Thank you, Dr. Lynn. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Item 9, <clears throat> discussion on the AEP PSO franchise agreement. Mr. Mayor and Council, um, uh, Frank Phillips is here with PSO AEP, and, and the 25 year agreement that's been in existence <laughs> comes due this year, I believe. And so there's a franchise agreement with all of our utilities, and I thought it would be prudent to discuss how those come about and what they are. The current in existence is a 25-year agreement that costs 2%, and then there's also a lighting feature in there, and I gave you a letter that Mr. Phillips shared with us from the PSO company and a copy of an ordinance. And so the discussion is tonight is to talk about when we would want to renew that franchise agreement because it is a vote of the people. And, and PSO and Mr. Phillips has been doing, I think, a ton of legwork trying to get all that set up. And we need to pick a date somewhere here in the front end of the summer and have that election. And um, so as we talk about that, the things that I just wanted to bring up was the term of the franchise agreement, the things that it covers, and what that is is we are charging a fee for them to ingress, egress our public right-of-ways and easements, and they have light poles, and they hang their wires, and they deliver power to each and every customer within the PSO agreement. And then the 25 years is basically, I've been asked lately, is why is it so long? Well, they have a huge infrastructure investment. And they have millions of dollars in that, and they're trying to recover those dollars. And so if you did it on a five or, say, a 10-year basis, they're probably reluctant to talk about that because of the ability to recover that investment. Um, not that they wouldn't, I'm just assuming that. But the main reason is is usually infrastructure dollars and what they have in there. And I believe they built a substation here recently. That was before I moved here, but um, that's a, probably a multi-million dollar structure. And that delivers power. And so Frank and I have been talking about when is the best time to talk about that franchise election. And then for us, is reading that and looking through that, is there anything that we would want to tweak in that agreement? Um, I will just take the low-hanging fruit. Nobody wants to talk about that, but you could discuss who was 2% where you want to be, or do you want to be a 3? And to be brutally honest, that'll be on the backs of all of us. So if we changed it from 2 to 3, you would go up 1% on your electric bill. And that's just being honest. But that's what those would talk about. But those dollars come back to the city in infrastructure dollars and those things that we do like that. But I'm not advocating that. I'm just telling you what those things are out there. The discussion tonight is to get you informed about what that franchise agreement is, the term of the franchise agreement, and the things on there. And probably Frank will want to allude to more of the things they do, but as you're aware, PSO offers community education trainings. They uh, do things for the city. Um, they offer and put up our Christmas lights. They work with us hand in hand in other things. They are now doing economic development. Um, I probably have missed two or three things that I had on my little mind and list there, but um, so they are advocates of the Henrietta and advocates of the delivery areas that they are in, in the eastern Oklahoma and other places. So um, this is an agreement that we need to talk about. And the main thing that the thrust is, is we just need to pick a spot out here, get it registered, and get the election going. Um, I, I jokingly talked about, and I'll do it here, is, is in the event the election failed, does he turn the switch off when he leaves? Um, <laughs> I hope we don't experience that, but I was curious. I had to ask. <laughs> and he's still laughing. So. <laughs> what are the, uh, does anybody have a list of the election dates for the remainder of the year? Yes, Frank has all of those. Yeah, um, yeah, please share it with us, okay? And then how long, does it take, how long do we need? To how long does it take to get this on the ballot, sir? Does anybody know? Yes, I can tell you. Uh, thank you all for having me. Uh, I very much appreciate, appreciate it, Ted, that you've been working with me on this. I met, I think we met about a month ago and discussed some of the, the items. Uh, yes, about election dates. Let me answer that first and I'll cover some of this other. Uh, the election dates for 2015, the next election date, a May 12th election. And, and how long does it take you to get on the ballot? The resolution would have to be to the, to the Old Week County Election Board by March 12th. Okay, so March 12th. So you're talking two. So you're talking basically two months out. We have to get it up there. Yes. Yes. Give May what? Then 12th. Yes, sir. Yeah. Election, I'm sorry. March. 12th. March 12th. It would not be two. That would be, be the resolution, resolution to the board. That's no that's later than. No later than. But no then the election would be May the 12th. Yes. June 9th is the next election date. And so we have to have the letter. To By April 9th, the the election. 
When do you have to have this done by? What's the shutoff date on our lights? <laughs> About 8 o'clock. <laughs> so if you want to take action, no pressure. Wow. Um, I think a June thing would June. probably be the... But you understand what I'm saying. What's the, yes. what's the drop dead date? We don't have one. Oh, we're we're going to teach them one orange and two we did. Yes, sir, that was my intent well, plan, was to have a discussion June, openly about where we want to be. Uh, and, then, and, then, and then we'll continue to negotiate that. So this is an education thing for you all. Okay, let's I think that you think... We don't want it to be by itself. No, but there's other, but there's other elections coming up. Because there's elections every month. I'm not, sure that they, I'm not sure that the Monkey County Election Board has to be scheduled for June or July at this point. I think next month you have the school bond. Yes, yeah. and there's and March the 3rd, I believe and it is. And April is when you have, you have council. Yeah, the city election. So we try to be respected of not trying to get on when someone else is having an election. Be it so pays for the cost of the election. Okay, so so we bear no cost for that. Then. No, sir. Oh, well, so it's happen if you're all comfortable. Yeah, obviously, just have it in July. That would give us plenty of time to. Well, really June, June, June. The, June the 9th. I think that would be a good thing. Well, that would give us plenty of time to get it on and get everything going. So I think well, June July we'll, would be a good thing. We'll make an agenda item for the March meeting and confirm it up then. And this is a discussion. And, 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 and so approve, the actual, we, yeah. approve the actual lease? We have two dates that we could hit, the May the 12th and the June the 9th, if that is. I wasn't sure they had a June election date when we looked. They just have special election dates. They okay. Just, and we have them all year this year. Sometimes there's not as many available as we do. Yeah, because the meeting is March 10th. Right now, is mm -hmm. it? Next week. So we would have to have a special meeting. Yeah. Like, no, if we have it by then. March seventeenth, and we have the okay. We have to the have the resolution to the, the for to the April. election board on March the twelfth. So we would have to do a special I you meeting. I thought you said April ninth. We're talking about the June election, right? Yeah, but, but yeah. Yeah, we could discuss and pass the actual June March agreement in March, and then get it on the June election. Yeah, and we will have the document to him by April ninth. Thank you. He was talking okay. about from May. Frank, March. Uh, we'll, we'll have a March agenda. And we'll, we'll decide, <laughs> the important we'll part. Decide on the March agenda. The, the important part was, was to talk about the, the schematics or the generalities of getting there. Um, I forgot one important thing, and that is the street lighting and the things that yes. you guys provide in that. So that's an addition. Could you elaborate on that, sir? You. you know, PSO served in Redis since 1927, and uh, one of the guys that worked today said. That I was probably there when that happened, but I'm not, <laughs> not that old as gray is because I have a 19 year old daughter. Uh, the, the PSO franchise agreement is a, is a non exclusive franchise. It doesn't mean nobody else could ever come in here. By law, they have to be non exclusive. So if somebody else wanted to put in the millions of dollars it takes to, to, to build an electric company, they could, you know, they could come into Henry. Uh, you mentioned the 25 year time frame. We did just, we, we built a new substation uh, for Henry, and those are multi million dollar investments. And what that, that, by having a 25 year time frame, that allows us to amortize that over a, an extended period of time. It also gives the community some, some sense of security that we're going to continue to serve. Uh, like I said, there's, there's nothing that precludes someone else from coming in. But uh, you know, we've been here forever. And we don't see ourselves as just a, a provider of electric service like Ted said. We see ourselves as a community partner. Uh, some of the things that I was going to mention. Uh, Annually, we collect and remit to the city of uh, Henrietta franchise fee that last year was $90,000. And that's 6% above what it was two year, or last year and 9% above what it was two years ago. So as Henrietta grows, the revenue grows. Uh, your street lighting, you mentioned the street lighting, <clears throat> you say $60,000 a year roughly by having a franchise with PSO. Your, your street lighting bill every month would be about $6,600 if you didn't have a franchise. It's $1,700 for that franchise. We also you noticed us doing some tree trimming, some system hardening where we repair lines, replace poles. Now, just last year on that project, we spent two hundred thousand dollars. And so we're, you know, we're invested in the community. We've got employees, we've got equipment. I mean, we're we're here. Um, we have a consumer program uh, outreach where this year uh, we have provided weatherization for when we get fixed sixty two homes where we've gone with people with relatively low income, they're able to apply. And we go in and do weatherization for them, and that's been over $100,000 that we've spent on that. Um, I just happened today to see the check that the uh, Henrietta Public Schools got for almost $21,000 for, it's a, it's a load reduction when, when PSO reaches a, during the summer, when we start getting our peak reached and our uh, 
power plants and, and the real demand on the system, businesses and, and uh, or the schools can ask to participate in a program where if they reduce their usage at that particular time, then we give them an incentive to do that. And so the, the Henrietta Public Schools got a check, like I said, for $21,000 in November. Um, you know, we also make other contributions. We, we've helped, I think the city and the head has gotten many grants the last couple of years for economic development. Um, so, you know, again, we don't, we see ourselves as community partners. <coughs> We're just proud to serve, proud to serve the communities we do. And Henrietta, I think, has been to me has been a shining example of the partnership with with uh, PSO. You know, it's small, but I think an important thing you guys do is help us put up the Christmas decorations each year and take them down. Well, and we appreciate that. I'm glad to help with that. A question: Did, did the, uh, does PSO give the city a break on the cost of electricity? I think that that's something that people would not know. And are we charged the same? Are we charged a fee for even the franchise fee or other taxes? Like you see, I think the, the citizens will want to know that. Yes, they're all the, the franchise fee applies to all the accounts, and then the city, the, just like any other utility, mm -hmm. we collect the franchise, remit it back to the city, so okay. the city gets their money back. They're all billed for it, but then they get the money back. Okay. Does the city get a break on any cost of electricity other than the the um, street lights that you do that? They do some rates depending on what rates they have on the, mm -hmm. of the businesses. Depending on what rate it is, we would just it would depend. I don't know if you've got municipal pumping. And yeah, the, the rate structure for our water plant and our wastewater plant are considerably different than say this building because of the load. Mm -hmm. um, so that's how they structure their rate mm -hmm. decrease or their rate structure. So it's on the amount of power we use. So our biggest users are our water plant infrastructure, wastewater plant, and then the lift stations. Mm -hmm. That are in place. Um, you do that with other businesses also, too, don't you? Yes, we do. You know, there's businesses that can look at what their usage is, and depending on what their usage is, we, we get them on the, on the rate that's best for mm -hmm. them. Just the, so the public knows that we're still out there yeah. paying our electric bill. In, in their letter, they put $200,000 this year in tree management, hardening of the improving of the system, and that is here in Henrietta. Um, they also pay $529,000 in property tax in Oklahoma County, which relates to about 88000 Unfortunately, the cities don't get property tax. So that goes to the schools, counties, and those things. Um, also, there's $100,000 in weatherization or in this program for efficiencies that he's talked about. If you haven't seen it, they were calling, I believe, door to door, because we got some people asking why they were calling. But um, they were basically, if you meet a, I think, a low to moderate income, and uh, some other things like that, then you can have a weatherization of your house done. And that was provided by PSO. So I don't know how many people took advantage of that. I think you just 62. said it, 62. 62 so homes. I tried to talk her into letting me, she wouldn't. So <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that's what the franchise agreement is. We have franchise agreements in addition with PSO. We have one with Sudden Link, uh, all the telephone providers, cable TV. Um, <coughs> I'm, I'm probably missing one, probably any telephones and those things like that. And a couple of those are also coming up as we talk about it. So, And this goes to a vote of the people. You know, what we do before the election, once you set the election day, then we start sending, we, we send letters to everybody in the community that don't know what the franchise is, what it does. Um, we, we do the advertising, we pay for every expense, we pay for the yeah. the, uh, the election board will usually build the city because you are the ones who are calling for the election. But as soon as you get the invoice, you get it to us and we reimburse it. We pay for everything else. We pay the, the ballots, the, the whole thing. As long as we're the only issue on the ballots. A slicker than Bruce Pig. So it's nice that when we come to do this, that we're not putting any expense on the city. Because the city has, you know, I mean, I've said in the council meetings and, and, and you've got some other issues, I think still on the agenda. So you all certainly have your hands full. So. Again, we, we want to we, we want it to be as, as inexpensive as it can be on the city to do that. It's our responsibility to, to do that. We also work with you all. But like I said, we, we just, you know, I'm proud. I've been with PSO for 34 years. And it's just been a wonderful place to work and to be able to work in the community. To be able to be, you know, some people say you guys are like paid for a uh, full-time full volunteer. And Lyle's so, very active. Lyle's incredibly active. If there's anything else, I'd be glad to answer at this time. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Item 10, discuss or act on the city manager's report. Your motion to approve. So moved. Second. Um, man, I shared most of it in the discussion we're items. We're um, today, and then, right? yeah, and then Jennifer alluded to the street cleanup or the cleanup on the front of our business. Um, in addition to that, we're fixing some water lines up on 75 Trujan and Main. Um, also, the the main reason we're there so everybody's clear. We have a bridge inspection program by ODOT. It's an unfunded mandate, and I love to tease ODOT about that. But it really is an unfunded mandate. Um, as soon as we get a bridge, corporation is the bridge. We were handed a 90-day letter, you will fix this or you will close it. Trujan is going to be one of those that's not in that position, but we are going to clean it up. Two things, hotel motel tax, Mr. Patel and um, the businessmen that own the motels here in town have all alluded to they want to do some of these things, and so they're spending those dollars with us, and then we're doing some things up there and cleaning that. And then, as you see, we pursue those and um, doing that. The neighbors are now asking us what they can do, so it's kind of working on what we wanted to do. I hope everybody likes it um, and uh, looks at what we're trying to do and, again, give a vision and, and a real vision. Um, so those things we're working on. We're moving forward with, I think, a lot of things that we're progressing. Um, I would probably advocate at the moment I have too many irons in the fire, um, but we try to make all those things happen. and. Uh, I think you see a lot of improvement coming forward. I think you see the departments doing a lot. Um, we've seen the fire department recently remodel an entire building, and now the police department's moved into the existing fire department or pre-fire department and expanded that, and they've done all the work themselves. If you have not been over there, they've repainted the building, they're restructuring the offices, they've carpeted, tiled, um, and all of this is being done by the people that work in here. Um, and we have had to hire some contractors or some people to do specialty things, but hats off to the police department, since you're sitting here. Um, mm -hmm. The fire department, the same way, those guys are reaching out. So when you're not seeing them do something out on the street, we're making them pick up a paint bucket. And uh, so, <laughs> and he's shaking his head, so he obviously knows. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but we're trying to expand, we're trying to make better services to you, the people. And I, I think those guys are doing it. And, um, we always have room for improvement. I won't decline that, but I think we're moving forward. We're seeing the employees really take a lot of pride. Um, if you see Arlie Gray, Kevin, Sean, uh, Emmett, uh, all those guys working on the street deal, those guys are excited about what they're doing. They are really glad that you guys stopped by and pat them on the back. Um, they are really excited about what they're doing for them. And so I hope that continues, and I think everybody else kind of picking their step up, and so that's our goal that we've been slowly working on, and it'll always be a slow change. Seeing Hedda, seeing you all involved, and the discussions will be spirited. And um, don't take that wrong, I think those are things that are good for us all to talk about the things that we're moving forward with. And uh, I just think those things are good, you've seen in here and we do those things, but I wanted you to see what other departments are doing. We're buying more equipment, some will argue why, but I think we buy equipment to make us operate better, more effective, and hopefully more efficiently, and that provides a service to you all. And uh, I think good things are happening, and we got a lot of things that are coming up, and uh, we're into the legislative session, and you'll see about 2,380 bills I seen on the list the other day. Um, I think 200 of them directly affect municipal entities mm -hmm. um, that I've seen so far, and two of them I think already are um, good things, and then there's several of them that are bad things. Local controls under assault again, and then we talk about dilapidated properties. Read those bills closely because they are uh, being asked to go after these properties and the state is taking away some of the ability to go after them so you know. Um, and it goes back to private property rights. So um, always understand that's where they're at. But as you come to us as a city and ask us why aren't we taking these structures out, well there's a good reason. There's a lot of municipal and state bureaucratic red tape there's a lot of things that are in place on private property rights, and there's a lot of things that we have to do civilly, and we have to have all of the I's and the T's crossed to go get them. And it's not as easy as it sounds. And then there is a direct cost when we do those things. So we are working on them, and we are slowly moving forward. Um, to be prepared, we're starting the spring cleanup. Um, all of you know our code enforcement officer. Some of you will know him through a letter. And uh, he had warned me today that he is um, warming up the postage machine. So he's already out doing it. And uh, 
mowing is coming, cleaning is coming, and you've seen what we um, are trying to do. And really, we're trying to present a better product, a more clean product, and we're trying to look the part. And uh, we'll always have those debates how far we should go or shouldn't go. But I think if everybody would understand, we're really trying to make an improvement to our city, to our town, and that's on our backs. And uh, that's what we're trying to do. So be prepared if you get a letter. Don't go totally crazy. Jody will work with you, we'll work with you, but we are serious about code enforcement, and we are serious about mowing. We are serious about trimming trees and cleaning back the easements and making it where it's more visible. And uh, hats off to all of you that do it, because the majority of us do it in you know, those things. We've been talking about animal control. That's a new item that's been on our horizon again. I, I don't know how to handle that. Um, I hope everybody understands that we deal with irresponsible pet owners when we are having to do that. And it's a difficult item for cities and towns to be laid at the rest of our feet to deal with cats and dogs that are strays and other animals. So um, we try to do that as eloquently as possible and we try to do it as, um, I'm trying to be as diplomatic as I can about how that is because I know it's a distasteful subject sometimes on what happens with stray dogs and cats, but it is what is being dealt with us today. Um, and it's something that we have to move forward with, but we can't accommodate everything that happens all the time. And we're trying to reach out to our neighbors and be as diligent and a willing a partner in that. But remember, we need to all work at being diligent about keeping our pets up and keeping them in our properties. Don't make the gentleman out here in the uniform come see you so that we have to deal with that. <laughs> we have a lot of things to do besides running down a stray dog or a cat. And uh, So other than that, I think everything's really positive. I think we're moving forward. I think we're doing some things. We can all argue whether they're the right direction or the wrong direction, but these things are really good for the betterment of our community. And uh, I enjoy doing it. Um, and it it's going to take us some time. And, it's one of those things I keep telling us is it's an apple and it's a bite at a time. And so we'll make those differences. And uh, thanks for the support, and we appreciate it here. And I will, the city employees really appreciate it. And so we're working diligently to get those things done. So thank you. But thank you, to Ted. to specify a little bit, if you haven't been out driving around, drive out Frisco, look at Robertson Highway Bridge. Our city crews did that. We were <coughs> that. took the white rock in. Off 10th Street, Balnaw Hill Corporation. What he keeps talking about that bridge, all of us know it as Balnaw Hill. Go look. It looks like something okay. that you wouldn't believe that is in Henriette. You can see that from I 40. You can see all the clearing that they've done from I 40. And our city crews did that. So when you see them, be sure and give them a pat on the back because they've worked very hard at what they've done. And we got people along the creek asking to get it done. Yeah. <laughs> Good point, you started a business. <laughs> but it started with Robertson Highway, so go look over there. Go look at our new fire department. If you haven't been out there, go look. It's amazing. It's the money we saved on that. Yeah. Well, people in, in the police department took the money we saved. The city saved uh, just by us doing the work and the officers doing the work. They need to pat on the back of what they have done. Yeah, and the uh, police department's coming along yeah. too. It's slowly but surely because they have to take what the fire department left behind. <laughs> and reuse it because they built all theirs how they want it out there and left what was here and so now they're building it to what they want it but go look because it's amazing at the process that has taken place in our city right before our eyes with this city manager and this council so remember just because it's not always what you want to see we are making progress every day with the money we say I mean just, uh, just the building that we got it's, the state gave us to, to, to the fire department. They never had to cross, cross the railroad track to go to a farm on either way. In the police department, I know I was up there, you couldn't even turn around without stepping on something in the police department. Now they got some room to move. It's nice, I'll, I'll tell you that. It's real nice. In the fire department, they couldn't turn. Now they got room to move. This money that we saved, if people have donated the stuff that we've got, I'm proud of what you guys have done. It just makes me proud that we've got something that we've got look forward to this. It looks good. I just get tired of hearing people gripe about it. They quit the gripe and start looking at what we've really done, you know, it'd be a different town. And see it with uh, your own eyes. Yeah. And so we're see it with your own eyes instead of just listening to what I you think hear from the negative. Uh, 
That's right. We're moving ahead on a lot of fronts across the board, all the departments. Uh, 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 as I said at the, at the Chamber of Commerce meeting, I'll, I'll put our employees up against any group of city employees I've ever been around. But all of them right. have kudos and a good job, folks. And Ted, good report. Thank you. Did you pull the council, please? Lyson? Yes. Cole? Yes. Kelzer? Yes. Cole? Yes. Good yes. Item 11, discuss or act on entering into executive session under 25. OS section 307B3 for negotiations pertaining, pertaining to the purchase of real property. The motion? Second. 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 Yes. Second. Yes. Second. Yes. Second. 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 Yes. Good. I do not have one with me. Item 12, discuss the act to reconvene into regular session. For a motion, please. Second. Second. Cole. Lyson. Yes. Cole. Yes. Kelzer. Yes. Cole. Yes. Kidner. Yes. Item 13, discuss the act on any action to be taken on matters discussed in the executive session. Is there a motion to authorize the city manager to proceed with, with negotiations on a piece of property? Make a motion to do that. Second. Second. Cole. Lyson? Yes. Cole? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Cole? Yes. 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 Item 14, discuss or act on a new business. There's no new business. Item 15, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Cole? Lyson? Yes. Cole? Yes. Kelzer? Yes. Cole? Yes. 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 <clears throat> And read the municipal authority regular meeting Tuesday, February 17th, 2015, 6 30 p.m. in the Civic Center, 115 South 4th Street. It's now in session. Roll call, please. Lyson, here. Paul. Here. Kelzer. Here. Paul. Here. 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 Item one discuss act on approval of the consent agenda. A, the financial report for January 2015. B, the minutes of the meeting held in January 2015. C claims for the month of January 2015. Motion to approve. So moved. Second. Hold. Clayson. Yes. Hold. Yes. Kelzer. Yes. Hold. Yes. Goodner. Yes. Item two, discuss the act on implementation of the surcharge on the municipal authority bill. A motion to approve. I make a motion that we had a four dollar surcharge for four months starting in March of 2015 to our utility bill for the purpose of raising the unbudgeted funds to pay for the audit conducted at the request of the citizens of our town. So, second. Second. Discussion? I'd like to make a few comments to start off the discussion. We'll pass it around, see if everybody have an opportunity to speak. Uh, within the last six months, we had a 15% increase on the utility bills for all of our citizens. That's come to roughly uh, close to $20,000 a month that we're bringing in more than we used to have. We, at the... Uh, when we had the election to uh, continue the sales tax, we redirected a half cent to the general fund for item for situation precisely what we're talking about now, unfunded uh, items. That's bringing in the better part of $20,000 a month. So if you add those two for a six months period, that's uh, in the neighborhood of $240,000 a month or more that we're going to have in the general fund that we wouldn't have had last year taking into account that we just passed a 15% increase on the utility rates for the citizens, I cannot support any, any sort of surcharge to further up their rates. So I'll pass the discussion to anybody else that wants to has comments. I know that many of you are saying that I did not request anything, and I know that, and, and I need to explain what I mean when I say requested by the citizens. This is important. Oklahoma law allows an audit to be conducted at the town's expense if only 10%, 10% of the registered voters sign a petition requesting it. In our case, that 10% equates to just a few hundred people. Okay? A petition was circulated and the required numbers of signatures were obtained. But it took two tries to get that. Two tries, therefore, 
it, we had just the bare minimum of people that signed that. There was very little support for this, but unfortunately there was enough. One item in the petition said that the audit would cost no more than $40,000. If you signed the petition and did not know that you would have to pay $40,000 for this, well, I'm sorry, it's a lick on you because you didn't read the petition because it said it in there, okay? The citizen signing that petition and asking the state to come in and look at the city operations in specific areas authorized the city, all the taxpayers in this city, not just the 10%, but all the taxpayers in this city, to pay up to $40,000 for that look. They authorized it. You all, we all authorized it. Whoever signed that petition authorized it. Well, the bill is in, and it's due, and it's $40,000. In essence, we have a small number of citizens that agreed, they agreed, the small number of citizens, to pay this bill when it comes due, and it's $40,000 to inspect our town books and our records in the hopes of finding evidence of fraud, waste, and abuse. Unfortunately, the individual's names who signed this petition are secret. As yes, they should be, Henry. We Hold on now. We, we don't know who signed this. And there are a lot of people that would send these people bills if they knew who they were, but unfortunately we can't. Preliminary reports from the auditors indicate that they found minor issues such as could be expected in any inspection or audit. One inspector told me personally that our Open Meeting Act, these are our agendas and our minutes from our meetings that we conduct, are some of the best they had ever seen. That was his exact words to me. The bill for the audit is due, and the only fair way to pay for this bill, because it was totally unbudgeted, there was no money set aside in the budget, we are trying to build the general fund up, and when we take $40,000 out of the general fund, then ultimately, we take 40000 out of what would be our reserve, which, we have, by the way, we required to have 30% by law. We were under that considerably. Well, we're in the process of building that up. The only fair way to pay for this is to have all the citizens pay for it. You divide it out equally among the accounts of all the utility bills. It's $16 per account. $4 per month, four months, this fiscal year, $16, and you've got your $40,000 because we have about 2,500 utility accounts. That goes up and down month to month, but 2,500 is a really good number, okay? That is why I support this fully. Well, what, what, be, what kind of be paid for. Let, let me make one paid for. Yeah, well, I think this is a fair way to pay for it. Well, the citizens, if it, it comes from a, a surcharge or if it comes out of the general fund, the citizens still pay for it. Every dime that we've got in our pocket the funds came from the citizens. But it reduces, I, it reduces the reserve by 40K, which the point of all the things we did was to get our reserve back up. Okay, we've got a bridge okay. down here on 4th Street that we've had fixed since 2011. We've got that bridge down that we've had fixed since 2011. We thought it was paid for. Ed, tell us what happened. There's $35,000 we're going to have to pay for. We know we're going to pay. $23,000 bill that we didn't know, didn't was, know was going to pay. Well, are we going to do a surcharge to pay for that? No, that was that's that's what I'm talking about. That's where we got money that we don't even what even supposed to spend. We got to spend. I it. like the improvements that are happening in our city. I do too. They're not free. Yeah. And I've had multiple and if you want people to tell me this is the way to pay for this. Many people. I see okay. nods. And I see nods out here. Nods out in the audience. Have done that. Yeah. Multiple other municipalities have done the same and exact thing. I'm not saying it's, it's I agree. It, it happens. Any further discussion? Anybody else have any comments? I think, I think we've raised enough money. This this council has more money to work with than any in the past ever had. We've changed money around, changed money around, borrowed money, done this, done that. And while we want to put some more on these people, we, we raised 15% on the water, 15% on the sewer, 15% on the garbage and it's got to we got to have some I needs instead of I won't you know like we was talking about with the parts and all this kind of stuff. I don't think it's a I won't this is a I need. They this asked one, this for it. They asked for it. But that's a lot of it is not. I'm going to pay for it. I'm going to have to pay for it like everybody else but I'm going to pay my, my fair share on it. You can yeah, and she can and I can and he can. We all got enough money to pay our bills. Yeah. Right? But there's people in this town that's living on a pretty They ask, they want it, so we got to pay for it. I'd make this point. On, the, on the, the combined financial report for January 2015, municipal 
the clearly transfer $134,000 this month. We went positive $227,000. Uh, I, I contend we have money in the general fund to pay for this if we want to do it. If we want to pay it for with a surcharge where the majority will rule. So I think we've spoken on this all we need to. I think, we, I think we've had that 227000 We haven't paid insurance. property tax insurance. We haven't paid vehicle insurance, nothing else. When you start paying for that, you're going to see that go down to nothing to do. So that. that's just the way it is, people. Okay. I'm just telling you. Well, I don't like anybody good. more than anybody else, but I've got to pay for it too. But we've got to have it paid for, and that's the only fair way to get it. John, hold the council, person. please. Clayson. Yes. Yes. Kowser? Yes. Paul? No. Goodner? No. Motion passed. Item 3, discuss act on new business. There is no new business. Item 4, motion to adjourn. Hold on. Second. Hold. Place. Yes. Paul? Yes. Kowser? Yes. Kowser? Yes. Paul? Yes. Kowser? Yes. Kowser? Yes. Kowser? Yes. Kowser? Yes. Kowser? Yes. Kowser?